How many's ready for the word today? All right, why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet. We're in this, uh, the study as we've been for the last while about the fruit of the Spirit, and we have our anchor text. We have Galatians. Can we throw that up on the screen? By now, we probably have that memorized or close to it. But here we go. But fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Today, we're going to be talking about gentleness. Let's go to your, uh, open your Bible. We're going to go to another scripture in Philippians. Philippians, just a few, a few books over. I love Philippians. This is a, just a, a power-packed little uh, book. This really came alive to me in a personal way during the days of 2020. If you study the contextual significance of the book of Philippians, you'll notice that the church in Philippi was a very unique church. It was a little church that didn't even have a building. They met by the, by the, by the river, by the lake. If you read the history of this church, you can find the history in the book of Acts. This church was uh, on the kind of the outskirts of town because it was made up of people like the Philippian jailer who worked for the government. He was converted, if you remember, under Paul's ministry. He was one of the deacons there at the church, a businesswoman that was there. And, and these other, we know from studying this that this was a collection of, of minorities, of people that, you know, they didn't like people, the culture really hated the government, Rome and that sort of thing. So anybody that had a job there was an outcast. So if you read the whole thing of Philippians with that lens, you understand the significance of what Paul writes to them, and this is very interesting what he writes to them, writing to people who know what it's like to be on the outskirts. But he writes some very powerful truths, and let's begin reading in chapter one. I'm gonna read this out of the New Living Translation because I really like how it breaks it down. Verse, chapter one, verse nine says, I pray that your love will overflow. Somebody say love. He's saying, first of all, we're gonna take a minute and go through this, just giving you a heads up. He said, I pray that your love will overflow. How many know what overflow means? It means to exceed the capacity of. And he's saying, listen, I don't want you to just say that you have love. He said, I want your love to overflow more and more. Why? So that you keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Church, let me encourage you what the Paul, Apostle Paul was writing because it's a temptation even today that we can come into church but we can stop growing in our faith. We can stop growing in the word. We can stop growing in sharing our faith. We can stop growing. My mom had a saying, she used to always say, our churches are filled with 20 year old Christians who are still in spiritual kindergarten. If we're not careful, that could be us. We could learn the songs, we could learn the scripture, we could learn all of this stuff, but that was never the intent. We are to keep growing. In what? Knowledge and understanding. I, I love these two words because we bring this out in ETS. Because when it comes to things, you have information, knowledge, and understanding. Information is just, just that. Facts and figures, information. Having knowledge means that you become familiar with it a little bit. You understand how it works a little bit. But understanding is the ability to take that knowledge and apply it to a situation. You see that in the medical field. You see that in, and I love watching food shows. I don't, I don't cook, I'm not, everything I try to do is terrible, but I love watching the food shows. They don't show up with a recipe book to the competition. Why? Because they have the understanding of how food works together. The, the, the word encouraged in scripture, to, to, it's, it's good to memorize the scripture. It's good to think about it and memorize it, but it's a whole other level when we have that understanding to know what Psalms 23 says to be able to apply it to my life. I'm just listening this morning. I know we're getting kind of right into it. But this is what he's saying. Paul is saying, I don't want you to just stay stagnant. I don't want you to just be singing the same old songs for 30 years. I don't want you to just be saying the same old scripture for 30 years. I want you to grow from glory to glory, from passage to passage in knowledge and understanding. Verse 10, he says, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live a pure and blameless life until Christ's return. He's saying, I want you to know what really matters because a lot of times what we get caught up in in life doesn't matter. When we were doing youth, I remember always having this conversation when, when in, in having four children of our own, we had a, a live-in youth group and, and, and we always had this conversation when life would get someone maybe super stressed, I would say, honey, in 10 years, none of what you're worried about is gonna be, is gonna be relevant. All the people in high school that you're feeling judged by, you won't even know them. 
All the fashions and the fads will be gone. Yes, the music you're listening to, your kids are gonna make fun of you for it. Just rest, oh, it's the coolest thing ever. Every generation says that. But he says, I want you to understand what really matters. It's not about the building and not about the lights and not about the, all the stuff that we do. It's about what really matters. And this is what matters, verse 11. May you always be filled. Somebody say filled. So he said overflowing first, and now he says filled with the fruit of your salvation. Now that's another way of saying the fruit of the spirit. That's kind of like the spiritual, oh, inspirational way. He's calling it the fruit of salvation. The subtitle of this series has been, the proof is in the fruit. Paul is saying, listen, we're gonna call it the fruit of salvation, which means if you're saved, you should be having some fruit in your life. Boy, this it, it, challenges. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. That's the fruit, the righteous character. For this will bring much glory, praise unto God. And if you flip over to chapter four, verse five, he says, let everyone see that let everyone see your gentleness in all you do. And I love the New Living Translation. It says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Because remember, the Lord is coming soon. Today we're gonna to talk about gentleness, the most misunderstood fruit. And I, I wanna share some things with you today that I believe is gonna, listen, I had to repent 75 times this week getting this message together. The Lord was just showing me some stuff. So I want you to join me as we just kind of get some things situated in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's here today. We thank you, Jesus, for this, this ongoing teaching series of the fruit of the Spirit. I pray, Father God, that you would just let your word go forth this morning. Let it go into our hearts. Let it bring strength. Let it bring growth. Let it, let it be like fertilizer, Lord. I pray, Father God, that, that, Lord, my words would be your words, Lord. Speak through me today, I pray. And let everything be led by your Spirit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I hope you've been enjoying this series. Come on, how many's been enjoying this series on the fruit? It's been some good stuff. Every single, thank you, Zach. Every, every single week has just been, in case you haven't noticed, and we've said it a few times, this is written to the church. This isn't written for the unbeliever. This isn't written for those out there and them over there. It's written for us in these seats, in this building, as well as those of us in this time that call ourselves Christians. This is what God is talking to his people. So I began to think about gentleness and, and, and I really, the Lord just was putting some things in my heart and, and, and I believe this is one of the most misunderstood fruits in this context. And, and we see that in one way with something as simple as a tomato. The ongoing debate, is tomato a fruit? Is tomato a vegetable? All right, let's see what camp you're in. How many are in the fruit? How many thinks tomato is a fruit? How many of you all say, nope, tomato's a vegetable? This is the thing about tomato, nobody knows, how many don't even like tomatoes? Thank you, that's my people. That's my people, right there. That's my, I've, I've, I've recently come into some decisions I've had to make for my health, which forces me to eat tomatoes, and I can't stand tomatoes. But I know I have to eat them. This is why, actually, you both are right. Scientifically, from a botanical standpoint, a tomato is a fruit, scientifically, <laughs> all right. But from a culinary standpoint, it is considered a vegetable, how it contributes to recipes. You'll never see a piece of tomato in a fruit salad with the grapes and the mango. If you do, I'm not eating it. So you both can be right. Here's the thing about it. Did you know that for a, a long period of time, tomatoes were thought to be actually poisonous? from a third century cookbook that was misunderstood that later uh, a French botanist gave it the, the, the word that means wolf peach. Wolf because it was beautiful, or I'm sorry, peach because it was beautiful, but wolf because it was deadly. These were literally considered to be poisonous. Cookbook even in 1595, we have a cookbook that calls it poisonous. Into the 1700s, they would consider it poisonous. The European aristocrats would often get sick and even die after consuming like tomato soup and tomato things. And so they would blame it on the tomatoes. Well, fast forward a couple of hundred years when science became uh, you know, established, we realized that the tomatoes weren't killing the aristocrats of that time. It was the lead 
dishes they were using because they were using dishes made of pewter, which is lead, a high lead content. So when you would put the tomatoes in there, the, the acidness of the tomato would bring out the lead and bring it in the soup. So they were actually dying of lead poisoning, but they blamed it on the tomato because somebody back in 1500 called it poisonous. Well, thank God, fast forward from 1700, a couple hundred years, food science, like I said, became established. And we realized, hey, guess what? Tomatoes are not poisonous. They're okay to eat. But it didn't stop there. Fast forward a little while longer as the nutritionalists came on the scene and they began to do you know, scientific research on, on, on all the different elements of our, nutri- of our nutrients. They realized, hey, not only are tomatoes toxic, not toxic, it's okay to eat them, but you need to start eating them on purpose because they are filled with boosting, nourishing things from your boosting your immune system, helping your skin to uh, cardiovascular issues. The tomato is a power packed vegetable slash fruit. So I believe this is what the Lord is showing us with something called gentleness because not only did we misunderstand tomatoes one way, we went from not eating them because they're toxic to it's okay to eat them if you want to, to even if you don't want to, you need to eat them because they're very good for you. So is gentleness. We think we know what gentleness means and we misinterpret it with a, with, with a wrong definition and we don't apply it to our lives and we wonder why we're not eating good fruit. And we're gonna get into that today. Gentleness, if we think about it, gentleness can always can be mistaken or maybe defined by softness, gentleness, mind, uh, or I'm sorry, mildness, almost kind of weakness, kind of limp-wristedness or sissifiedness, if I could say it like that. You know what I'm saying? That, that's kind of what comes to our mind. Whether it's right or wrong, that's usually what comes to our mind when we think about that. Oh, he's so gentle, she's so gentle. But it's way much more than that. Because if we misunderstand this fruit, it could, it could bring us into a situation that is not healthy for us. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So gentleness is often contrasted with harshness. You know, a good way to find out what something is when you don't know it very well, find out what it's opposite of. How many know every superhero has a supervillain, right? Superman had who? Batman had who? Right, so we all know that, that every superhero has a villain. And what do these villains do? They know the weakness of that superhero and they try to target it. The same thing is with the fruit of the spirit. If I could say this, if gentleness is the fruit of the spirit, harshness or anger is the weed of the flesh. If you've ever done any kind of gardening, you quickly understand that in that flower bed, if it's untreated, there'll be stuff sprouting up in April that's both green both healthy looking, both strong, but it's not until when the, 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 the fruit bearing season comes, you realize one's a fruit, one's a flower, and one's a weed. Weeds are not always that easy to spot, and this is what happens. So what gentleness is to the spirit as a, as a, as a give and take, so is anger to the flesh. Now, some of us have a natural, gentle disposition that are just can be, excuse me, very, very gentle, very soft, very soft-spoken. God bless you for that. I'm one of those that did not get that gene. I tried. My mom said when I was little, I remember this, I had my cowboy boots on and I would walk with my heels and I would just put my head down and boss everybody out in preschool. (laughs) My mom reminds me of that all the time. Then God gave me the most sweetest, gentlest person in my wife, Lindsay, to help me understand that I need to make sure that that doesn't come across because it's not gentle, right? My wife reminds me of that all the time. Let me keep going before I get in trouble. A lot of us feel like, you know, we have a straightforwardness or we have a bluntness, and so we just think that's okay because that's the truth. That's just the way God made me. Oh, what does the Bible say? If any man be in Christ, he's a what? Why do we bury our struggles under the personality of who we are? Why is it okay for us to be a certain way? Because if I, last time I read in the scripture, we're not to walk according to the traditions of the flesh. We are to walk according to the teachings of the spirit. And so the Bible does tell us to speak the truth, but let's keep reading. What does it mean? Speak the truth in love. In fact, one of my other scriptures that I love to quote, especially to my kids, is we were talking about, listen, how you talk to one another. What did did the apostle write? He said, let your speech be seasoned so that it may impart grace to the hearer. And we're gonna talk about gentleness today. Gentleness differs from kindness. Gentleness, here's the difference. Kindness is just that, an act of kindness. Gentleness speaks about reaction. That's the whole message. We could go home right now. 
Kindness is doing something kind for somebody. That's great, holding a door open for somebody. We had a whole week on kindness. I don't need to repeat that. Gentleness is a specific one, hear me, that has to do with how you react with somebody else, how you treat somebody else. Gentleness is this, gentleness extends grace. Gentleness extends love and kindness. What is grace? Undeserved favor to the most difficult people in our lives. Yes, that person that just came to your mind. Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still heathens doing our own thing, Jesus died for us. Have you ever stopped to think that Jesus was left eternity, came to earth, went through the manger, born of a virgin, lived his life, was betrayed, beaten, crucified, buried, dead, resurrected, all of that. You know, he would have done that if it were just for one person. Think about that. Thank God he went through that. That comes from a spirit of gentleness. And let me, let me tie this all together. Gentleness comes in specifically when we are at odds with somebody. You know, that person's just trying to troll you. That person's just kind of trying to draw you into a, a debate or an argument. We have to understand how to correct a situation. You have kindness, gentleness, and meekness. In fact, if you're reading from a King James Version during this, your Bible calls gentleness meekness because that's truly what it is. Moses was the meekest man on earth, the Bible says. Meek is a word we don't use these days. Meek is an old, old fashioned word, but gentleness, meekness are very interchangeable in the scripture. This, has, this word has two definitions, and these are my two points today. I've got two points today. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> two points today. I didn't say how many sub points, just two points. No, but here, here's what it is. Meekness, gentleness. Meekness is power under controlled, also used in a beneficial manner. Those are the two points. We're gonna, talk, we're gonna dissect those in a moment. Meekness does not retaliate and is patient when it's wronged. Gentleness is the ability to correct someone or something without harshness, to treat with tenderness and kindness. When my daughter, I shared a story Wednesday that my daughter, uh, when she was little, she fell off the slide in the backyard and broke her arm. And, and so um, when she came in the house, we got her cleaned up and realized her arm was broken. In that moment, I instantly realized she needs to get to the hospital. <laughs> wow, winner there, huh? I instantly realized, okay, we gotta get her to the hospital. I didn't scold her. I didn't, Why were you playing on the slide? Why were you outside in the summer? Why were you being a kid? In that moment, I picked her up and I rushed her to the hospital and I brought her there for treatment. That's exactly what gentleness is. It talks about a reaction. Oh, and there's one more definition. Can y'all handle this today? Can y'all handle this today? When you study this word in the original language in the Bible, it means unharsh, like I just said, but it means to respond on somebody else's behalf. Let me explain this to you. When we, come, when we come to the altar and we say, Jesus, forgive my sins and wash me away, because the Bible says that in the eyes of God, our righteousness are filthy rags and we're repulsive to God. How many are with me so far, okay? When we come to the altar and we say, Jesus, forgive my sins, the Bible says that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Come on, how many can rejoice for that today? We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which means when God looks at us, he looks at us and he sees Jesus. He looks at us and he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our past. He doesn't see our failures. He looks at us and he sees the righteousness of Jesus that is, we're clothed in. That's an awesome way and a time to say amen, amen? But our fellow man, when we come and we say, I'm a Christian, I go to church and we get that reputation, our fellow man sees the humanity of Christ which means everything you do to them, everything you say to them and how you treat them and interact with them, they're looking at it through, they don't see you anymore, they see Jesus. They see you're representing Christ. So there's some baggage that comes with that promise. We have a responsibility, which means when someone comes at us a certain way and we respond to them, are we responding to them like Jesus would? Or are we responding to them because that's just the way I am? We're talking about gentleness today. To be clothed in Christ means that we represent him in everything that we do. Yes, especially in those moments when we're 
made angry, especially in those moments when we're, things don't go the way we want them to go, especially in those moments when people aren't following the instruction or whatever the case may be. It's those moments that we are told to walk in gentleness and in meekness. Matthew Poole's commentary says this about meekness. It is the forbearance of passion, rash anger, and the hastiness of spirit. Forbearance is just self-control, which means, and I know that's next week, so I don't wanna get into that too much, but there is a little element talking about gentleness, that forbearance of passion and rash anger. We have a decision to make. The expositor's Greek Testament says, meekness is the outcome of true humility. The bearing towards others which results from a lowly estimate of ourselves. Now let me clarify something just for a moment, before, especially we get too further into this. A lowly estimate of ourselves is not talking about having a low self-worth. It does not, listen, when I'm talking about gentleness and how to respond to, to uh, adversity and things like that, we're, we're not talking about those extreme cases where someone may be in an abusive relationship or maybe someone has a toxic friend or family member that is just taking advantage of you and abusing you. Listen, those, that's not what I'm talking about. Those, those are unhealthy boundaries, and it may come to a conversation where you say, listen, uh, you're treat, you're, I'm not going to let you take advantage of me anymore, uh, whatever the case may be, and we're going to part ways. Um, John Brevere has a great teaching on this whole, whole topic that he experienced uh, when he was in college with a roommate that was uh, uh, taking advantage of him in a very sincere way, because we often think that uh, because I'm a Christian, that means I got a, I, I, I got a tolerance tolerate this stuff. That, that's not what the Bible says. If you want to study that further, you can go to Jude and read the book of Jude, chapter, uh, verse like 22, 23, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Talks about healthy boundaries when you're dealing with an abusive situation or a toxic situation. I just had to kind of address that because I, we're all hearing this message and we all think different stuff. This teaching is to the church to how to talk to other Christians and church people on the outside in day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day misunderstandings, day-to-day -day things. We're not talking about those other, those are, you have every right to run away from an abusive situation or anything that's toxic. Amen? Everybody under, kind of understand that with, okay. Gentleness and humility go hand in hand. In fact, you could say it like this. You could write this down. Maybe put this on at their Facebook. Gentleness is the fruit that grows on the branch of humility. I thought that was good. I wrote that down twice. Gentleness is the fruit that grows on the branch of humility. Because when you see yourself as a low self-worth, uh, it's not that you, you think you have a low self-esteem or anything like that. It's saying that I don't think I'm better than you, I don't think I'm higher than you, so I'm going to engage with you as though we're equals. I'm gonna engage with you and talk in a civil manner or in a civil understanding. Let's look in Philippians chapter two. I think we have this on the screen. Philippians chapter two. He says, but Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I love this because if Jesus himself could leave his, his position in heaven and wrap himself in mortal flesh to be hindered by flesh, to be, to be limited by what we have as human beings, he did that willingly, became a servant. He did that out of a spirit of gentleness. Because listen, I believe we all could agree that we need to see some major changes in the world. How many would agree with that? We need some major changes in the world. But let me tell you something. We're, if we want to see change in the world, we have to present a solution that is better than their problems. Amen. Jesus, we know in scripture that Jesus was with the sinners and the tax collectors and the harlots. He was with these people all the time. And listen, make no mistake about it. He wasn't in there doing stuff with them. He wasn't in there uh, turning the tricks and getting drunk and getting high with them. He wasn't in there doing that stuff. He was in there showing them there is a better way because the Bible says there is no darkness in light. Light can go into a dark place, but it doesn't stay dark because light is stronger than darkness. You go into a dark room, you turn the light on, boom. 
You can see instantly. There's no struggle, there's no fight. When Jesus was in those moments, he was teaching these guys, listen, I know you might find yourself addicted to this or addicted to that or feeling a certain way because society has labeled you and cast you out. He's saying, listen, I'm showing you there is a better life. There is a better life that's without guilt, without shame, without the hangover, without all the confusion. He's saying, I have a better way for you because he was under a spirit of gentleness. The first point, like I said earlier, is power under control. Power under control. And I, ho I hope you guys can get in on this in the camera. This is power under control. Because my dad used to always have a saying. He would say, son, when a cup is tipped, you can really see what's on the inside. How many, how many know about that? Because that's how life can be. Sometimes when, when we're bumped, we, that's only when we know we're on the inside. So I got this beautiful vase my wife made me. She does such a great job of making all these props. She made that well last week. She made this vase today. This is a beautiful vase. It's got flowers, got birds, looks very springtime, looks very nice. It's just, it's just very comforting, very nice. This is how we can be sometimes when we come to church, you know, because this was a sticker that she put on. That's not what this vase looked like. She put a sticker over it. She covered all the blemishes. She covered everything. So on the outside, we got this beautiful looking sticker. We, we're, we're brother Christian. We're super spiritual. We've got all the, 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 the experience. We got all the knowledge. We got all, we have arrived, brother, sister. And while we're in here, and while this thing is standing still, oh, we look beautiful. But here's the thing about rebellion. It never manifests until it's crossed. A snake in the grass will lay there all day long, but the moment you step on it, then and only then will it bite you. So sometimes we walk around with all of our spiritual pride and we don't realize that we're a coiled up copperhead laying in the weeds. And the moment that a leader comes and, and might press on our ego a little bit or a minute when our neighbor comes and presses on our ego a little bit, then we bite and say, who do you think you are? And all of a sudden our cup is tipped and we get to see what's really inside. And all of a sudden we go to the restaurant after a Holy Ghost service and the lady gets our order wrong and we just chew her a new one. And then a guy in traffic with our River Ready bumper sticker. Listen, if you are a bad driver, take that thing off your car. <laughs> and we go through traffic and all of a sudden someone gets a little too close, we just slam on our brakes and we just give them a one finger salute. Uh-oh. They hope nobody saw that. That's, you get the point. And so before you know it, we've just made a mess out of everybody and everything. And everything, and if you were up here, you could smell, this smells really bad. <laughs> and before you know it, not only the, you know, we, we made a mess on the outside, we made a mess on the inside. That's what we're talking about today. Because many of us can be like the Pharisees where, where we, are, we look good on the outside, but we think we're walking in gentleness because we're soft. But in actuality, when we're bumped, what comes out is not Jesus Christ. I love, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite movie series is the Karate Kid movie series. I just love those. Well, they remade it here a few years ago. You might remember with Jackie Chan. Remember the new one they made? There's a scene in that movie where the little, where the little boy is getting bullied by the, by the, by the group of kids. And, and, you know, Mr. Han is his name. And he sees it a couple of times. And then this last time, man, he's just, this, this kid's trying to fight them all off. But he's, he's about to get whooped for good. So in this scene, you may remember, in this scene, Mr. Han jumps over the fence. Now, the one in the 80s, Mr. Miyagi took out these teenagers, a full grown man took out these teenage boys. That was another time. That was the 80s. So when they remade it, they had to kind of change it, make it a little more politically correct. But I love, I love this because listen, there's a teachable moment, I'm talking about gentleness. So here's this Kung Fu master, or karate, excuse me, master, and he gets in here and all these boys are all karate students and they're beating up this one. So he gets in between them, but the difference is, when they start punching him, he doesn't punch him back like Mr. Miyagi did. He takes their arm and he directs it away and, and pushes them into a fence. And he takes this one and he catches their arm and he pulls the sleeve out and he wraps it around his head and spins them in the floor. So there's a whole scene where, where, where Mr. Han is not hurting these boys. He's just playing defense enough to just keep them away from harming the little boy. That's the same thing what we're talking about when it says power is under control. He had the power to take those little boys out, but he understood the repercussion. He understood they were just children. He understood that they couldn't be, they couldn't, he couldn't treat them like that. So all the power and all the knowledge and all the right that he had, he had to control it and just kind of play defense to where enough to where they would stop. The same thing as the scripture in Philippians, because Jesus could have said, you know what, mankind's been doing it wrong for thousands of years. Father, I'm not going to that cross. I'm not going down there and dealing with those boneheads. They deserve what they get. Light them up, dad. 
I'm so glad he didn't do that. I'm so glad that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and he played defense knowing that he could have squashed us like a bug, but he just played defense to get us to the cross. Are you getting this today? Power is under control. Gentleness is in the context of how we respond to somebody. In fact, gentleness doesn't happen until there's a conflict. You don't know if you're in rebellion or pride until you're told to do something you don't wanna do, like I said earlier, because the, the natural reaction is, well, they deserve it. Well, they deserve it. Listen, just because we might have the right to mistreat somebody, just because we might be in the right because we were wronged or whatever, doesn't give us the right to spew over them. We can't be doing that and walking in the spirit of gentleness. And like I said earlier, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not talking about becoming anybody's doormat, but this is what we're talking about, how we respond to one another. This is something that Pastor John and I would talk about a lot because the definition of meekness is not weakness, but like I said, power under control. If you, ever, if you knew John Sherman on a personal level, this man exemplified the word meekness, power under control. This man served in the United States Marine, overseas, fought in combat, finished his career at the, at the federal prison, not as an inmate, but as an officer. <laughs> had to clarify that. This man had the physical ability and the mental know-how to take you to the ground before you even knew what was happening. That's what he did for a living. He could do it. As our church began to grow, uh, we began to get some crazy situations and things, and he said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna establish a security team. I said, brother, I couldn't think of anybody better to qualify to do that. And so we would start to grow. We would, even with all the things in the news, I would look back on and I would tell him this. I literally was one of the last things I told him before he passed, he and I would talk about this. I'd say, John, thank you for what you do. Because I'd look back on Sunday, we're all rocking, we're all doing good. And I look back and I see John doing this with his earpiece. I already knew he was watching. I already knew I didn't have to, I didn't have to worry because he knew what was happening. And he, because why? Because he understood power. Now he didn't just stand at the door and are you gonna do something bad today? Boom. <laughs> no, 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 he had power under control. He had the capability to take anybody out, but he just waited for when it needed to be done. You understand what I'm saying? Why is, now listen, let's go to the scripture here. Jesus invites us. He says, come and join me in the ministry of meekness. Let's go to Matthew 11. I think we have that up here. Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Everybody say Learn. Learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus is calling you and me to the ministry of meekness. We're waiting for the pulpit to open. We're waiting for the music to open. We're waiting for all the high profile and God is saying, I don't want any of that. I want you to join me in the spirit of humility, in the spirit of meekness, in the ministry of meekness. Because listen, this whole series has been us turning a, cor a corner from acknowledging to allow. You ever watch those, those, those shows, uh, the Hoarders TV, uh, the network has a TV show of Hoarders. How many has ever seen that show? And these individuals, they, they are suffering from, from all sorts of mental illness and things. That's a real thing. And, and, and it's easy for people on the outside. How could they let that happen? Listen, there's some real mental and emotional trauma and things that you know, people get. You never Listen, it's not our place to judge how people end up in a certain place. That's what I'm talking about today. Let's have some gentleness. But there's a difference between acknowledging and allowing. Here's what I'm saying. They acknowledge, I have a problem. I need to get some help. So they bring the TV show out. But the minute the dump trucks roll up and the minute the workers come in there and start carrying stuff out, then they stop. Time out. I can't do this. My whole point is this. We do that with the Lord. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, use me. Lord, do these works in my life. And he's saying, okay, let's get to work. And the minute he starts showing us some stuff, ah, that's not me, Lord. Stop too much. You hear what I'm saying? These are those moments. God will bump your cup, brother, just to see how you act. He will bump your cup, sister. And when something comes out that's ungodly, that's an indication there's not gentleness there. We need some gentleness. Now, I find this very fascinating to me. Why did he say, come and learn from me, all you that are weary and heavy laden and tired? Here's why. Because when we're tired, when we're drained, when we're emptied, gentleness is often the first thing to go. Whoop. Come on, let's be real. When we're irritated, we have a long, hard day at work, we come home, the last thing we wanna do is put up with the kids and the wife and the whatever. I'm just saying, not me, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We have a hard, you know, when we find ourselves blown up at everybody, 
We find ourselves just like we used to say, ready, fire, aim. And I worked in sales and we would have management come in from, uh, from Cincinnati and they would parachute into somebody's route. And if something didn't look right, boy, they would fire off emails, threaten to fire people, not even understanding, hey, maybe the truck broke down today. Maybe somebody had a sick and they had to go home early. There's others, they never asked the reason. So we would always call them the ready, fire, aim people. Those people that just start shooting everybody and then wait, oh, is that really what happened? I'm sorry. Well, too late, you done killed everybody. We do the same thing in our relationships. How many of us have relationships that are strained or even obliterated because of what, something we did? During the era of 2020 and 21 and 22 with all the turmoil and all the things and, and we were just losing our ever-loving mind with everything. How many of us blew and destroyed relationships and marriages for just because we didn't walk in gentleness? Why? Because we're tired, we're drained, we're frustrated. God is saying, come unto me. Jesus said, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn how to be gentle. Because that's a real thing, amen? In Isaiah, I don't have time to go there, but you can write this down, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 says that, that talking about the shepherd, this is a prophecy of Jesus. He said that the shepherd will come and rule with an iron fist. And yes, he will do that. But a couple of verses later, in, in between 10 and 11, he says that the shepherd will pick up the lamb and carry him to the fold. There's a, a, what we're talking about today, we're talking about gentleness. Because listen, the gospel is always about the stray. The gospel is always about that one, the black sheep of the family, that one coworker that you just can't stand, that one neighbor that just aggravates you, that child you have that just, you bang heads with them all the time. This is what the gospel message is all about. So before we say, ain't nobody got time for that and we run away or we just let them have it and walk away, let us understand that we are to be walking in a spirit of gentleness so that we can restore this person. Gentleness is not only the absence of harshness, but power to use in a better situation. Here's the second definition. It's not just power under control. You use it beneficially. Write this down if, if you want to, if you're taking notes. Remedy the situation without ruining the relationship. Remedy the situation without, uh, I'm sorry, without ruining the relationship. There was a, I was reminded of a, of a story that I remember when I was a kid watching Mr. Dress Up and Fred Penner and how many remember those shows? One of my favorite ones was um, Today's Special. You know, the, the mannequin that had the magic hat when he came on, he became alive. I remember some of those shows, come on now. I remember this, this, this cartoon, they would always have a little moral story and a little, you know, uh, stop, stop clay animation. But I remember this story, maybe you've heard of me, read it in a book, it's, a, it's an old tale, an old fable called The North Wind and the Sun. And in case you forgot it or never heard of it, it's a very simple story. One day the North Wind and the Sun were debating, who's the strongest? And the Sun said, I'm the strongest, I'm big and fire. And the North Wind said, no, I'm the strongest, I'm cold and, and I'm this and I'm that. Well, the story goes that while they were debating, there's a man walking down the road all by himself wearing a coat and a hat. And so one of them says, I got it. Whoever gets that person to take their coat off, they're the strongest. And so the North Wind said, I'll go first. And the story goes that the North Wind began to blow the, the wind. He began to make snow and coldness come and harshness and and everything. And all that man did was cling closer to his coat. It made him hold on to his coat. It made him just grasp it a little bit longer to where the North Wind eventually blew himself out. Then the sun said, okay, I'm gonna take my turn. And all the sun did was step out from behind the clouds and just let himself be front and center and let the warmth come out, let the brightness come out. And you know what happened in this little story? That that man eventually got really hot and took off his coat and sat it down and enjoyed and basked in the sunlight. So many times we think that in order for us to get our point across or to do our thing, we gotta be like that north wind. When all God is saying, listen, let the righteousness of Jesus that I've put on you, let it shine in that situation. Let it shine over that loved one. Let it shine over that coworker. Let it shine over that conflict. You, all you gotta do is stand up and let it shine. Amen. Amen? The second one is, like I said, is used beneficially. Have another cup over here. You got brother, sister, spiritual over here, and you got brother, sincere. Now this guy, a little short, not quite as tall and slender, a little short and round. It's okay to laugh. I'm very comfortable in my physique. <laughs> I already got my girl. All right, 
This one's plain, it's just, it's just, it's just plain. There's no sticker, there's no design. This, this just came, this second part just came right before service, so y'all getting a treat today. But this guy, when he gets bumped, there's something else that comes out. What you can't see is that, what did Paul, what did we say in Philippians? Let your love be overflowing. What's in this cup is sweet syrup from the stream. This is sugar water, baby. So when I'm bumped on it, oh, sludge don't come out, little love comes out. Oh, honey, that's okay. I know, I know you've been having a bad day. When you get cut off in traffic, all of a sudden, little love comes out. All of a sudden, little grace comes out. All of a sudden, and what does it do? It makes everything sticky with love and sticky with happiness and sticky with saying, listen, I understand you might be having a bad day. Listen, we got an issue. Let's talk. Oh, you know what I'm saying? We spill this out here, and all it is is bringing everything, making it sweeter and making it better. It, you can pour this into the most bitter cup of coffee, and guess what it will do? It will make it sweet. I can pour this nasty stuff in the freshest pond of water and it will pollute. Which one do you want to be? Which one do you want to be? And this is what we're talking about today. There's, there's a clip, I don't have time to show it, but there's a clip of, of a, uh, you may hear the word Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a, a scientist, but he talks about when cars first came on the scene. He's saying when cars first came on the scene, they were killing everybody. There was, uh, traffic was driving, it was a free for all. They were running the cars into buildings, they were running over pedestrians. But instead of saying, listen, we need to get rid of these automobiles, instead of doing that, what they do, they begin to put lanes in the road. What they do, they begin to put stoplights up. They begin to put crossing guards up. Then they begin to increase safety in our cars. And we have airbags, and we have all this stuff. And the moral of the story is he said this. He said, when you care about the final product, you will find a solution to fix the problem. And that's what we're talking about with people today because it's so easy for us to just write people off, to send them on their way, to just disagree with them, to just whatever. But God is saying, listen, I want you to see the value in that person. I want you to look past what they look like on the outside. I want you to look past their, their history. I want you to look past what they did to you. And I want you to be like that bright sun to understand that they need a little bit of love that you got in your heart. So spill on the love and not the flesh. Amen? Amen. Yes. You know, we're talking about fruits. Amen, go ahead, you can praise the Lord for that. Give me some water anyway. We're almost done. I'm, I'm trying to really be conscious of the time today. We're talking about trees and all that stuff and fruit. That's just been the illustrations going on and on. You know, I was reminded that when, when, when someone who maybe owns an apple orchard or some kind of grove, that's their livelihood. But you know, when seasons come and seasons go, pesticide, pe pests come, locusts, and, and all sorts of lady, but all sorts of things will come. What do they do in those moments? Well, hey, our trees are infested. Let's just cut them all down and burn them. That's it. 80 years of history gone. They don't do that. What do they do? They find a solution, whether it be a, a pesticide or whether it be a, 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 another animal that eats that pest. I don't, they find a solution. Why? Because they care about the tree. So when we go home and we look at that unsaved husband, unsaved wife, or unsaved person, instead of getting frustrated with them and aggravated with them, let's see the potential in them so that we can respond with a spirit of gentleness and not throw away the healthy tree because it has a few bugs in it. Amen? We see this in John chapter 8. We see Jesus when he was confronted with the woman caught in adultery. You remember the story. The Bible says that they all gathered around her to stone her. And then Jesus said, all right, you without sin, cast the first stone. And he went on, and he was writing in the dirt. We don't know what he was writing. He was writing something in the dirt. And then the Bible says, one by one, they left her. And at the end of that passage, he says, Jesus said, he raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are your accusers? She said, I have none, Lord. He said, neither do I, but go and sin no more. That's the gentleness. Because there is a time to bring correction. There is a time to bring in guidelines. That's when and that's how. He could have stood up and he said, I am the creator of the world. He had every right to enforce judgment upon this young lady. She had, she had violated and so did the dude or wherever he went to. But the point of the story is this, that he chose gentleness to bring her to a place where she left that lifestyle. He didn't jump all over her. He didn't do this and didn't do that. I want to end this with the story in uh, Luke chapter 10. If you, can, if you still got your Bibles open, would you go there with me? And we're going to take the last, last just 10 minutes. I want to, this, is, this is the meat of what I want, really want to get to today in this, one of my favorite par parables. Because we have this story, it's, called, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. But I want to spin this and show you a couple things in this passage. I'm going to do it in just, give me eight minutes. And we're going to talk about talking about walking in gentleness 
every day because it doesn't do us any good to come in here and have a teaching and have a slideshow and have a Bible and then walk out there and still be the same old way. Walk out there and still act, treat people a certain way. Let's look here in verse 25, chapter 10. He says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Somebody say troll. They stood up, he tried to test Jesus saying, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, I love how he says this. What is written in the law and what is your understanding of it? You see, Jesus was meeting him right there. He was me- this isn't the first time he's had conversations like this. He said, what do you think the Bible says and how do you apply it? Think about that. He let the- he'd heard from that man. So in verse 27, he says, uh, so he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? Jesus said to him, good. Do this and you shall live. And in my mind, I can picture Jesus being surrounded by people. I can see Jesus saying, good, let's let it go and walk away. Oh, but he couldn't. Trolls can't stop trolling. How many know what I'm talking about? Verse 25, or I'm sorry, 29. But this man wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And I can see him elbow his buddies. (laughs) I got him. I got him because they were always trying to get Jesus. You see it on YouTube all the time. These, these Christian apologists, they go to these colleges and they'll stand in a circle and these guys will, these atheists, people will throw out, oh yeah, if God's real, how come famine happened? You know, all this stuff. I love watching that stuff. And I love this. Did you ever think that we only have this story in the Bible because somebody tried to troll Jesus? This story would not be told if that man hadn't tried to reel Jesus into an argument. Instead of Jesus turning around, power under control, could have summoned a 12, you know what, Lord, send 12,000 angels to kill this man and everybody with him because I don't feel like dealing with him today. I'm in a bad mood. He had the power to do that, but he restrained himself and he said, you know what, I see the value in you and others that are gonna think like you, so I'm gonna tell you a story. That's what dads do, that's what men, that's, that's what we do, right? My kids are reminding me that today. Dad's always got a story. (laughs) Listen to this, verse 30. And Jesus said to him, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, who wounded him and departed, leaving him for dead. Now by chance, a priest came by down the road, passed by, saw him and went to the other side of the road. I'm just reading fast. Likewise, a Levite came. When he came, he looked and he passed to the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he saw him and had compassion on him. And so he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured into oil and the wine, put him on his own donkey, and took him to an inn and paid for him to be treated. On the next day, he left and gave money to the innkeeper and said, make a tab for him. And when I come back, I'm just paraphrasing, he said, I'm going to bring and pay, settle his account in anything that he owes. And then Jesus says, so which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? 37 He said, and he who showed mercy, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Let me break this down for you just for a moment. You gotta understand that in that culture, there was extreme, I'm using that word properly, extreme animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. Extreme, extreme, okay? In fact, let me show you something. There's a map, did we we get the map? Map, map, map. You see this map? Hopefully the guys can grab a full screen of it. You see the very top? where Capernaum and Sea of Galilee, that's where Jesus lived, okay? When they would go down to Jerusalem, which is right here, to worship, look what they would do. They would go to Samaria and walk all this way to Jerusalem, just so they didn't have to go through Samaria. That's how bad they hated the Samaritans. They were on donkeys, people. They weren't taking 275 around downtown. They, this, they were going, this alone, just to give you context, this was the story right here, Jericho to Jerusalem. This was only 17 miles. Did you catch that? Some of y'all sleeping. Come on, wake up. 17 miles from Jerusalem. Look how far they were to Galilee. Look how far they walked around because they didn't want to go through Samaria. When Jesus was telling these people about this story, they all knew this road. This road in the Hebrew was called Wadi Kilt. This road was notorious from Jericho to Jerusalem. It was notorious for bandits. Notorious because it was a, it's a barren wasteland. You can go there today. They would hide in the caves. And so when Jesus told them, he already knew, the people around already knew this is going to be between the Jews and the Samaritans. All right, we know the Jews are going to be the good guys and the Samaritans are going to be the bad guys, but Jesus flipped the script on them. 
And this is what got him so angry, is he said this, he said, when, when a certain man was on a path, he was beaten by robbers. The Bible says his clothes were taken. Why is that significant? Well, without giving you a whole bunch of history, let me tell you this, garments, in the Bible represent identity. We see that in the garden. We see that with Elijah and the Old Testament prophets. We see that in the tabernacle when they had to wear certain garments. In the New Testament, we understand that garments signify identity. This man had his identity robbed and taken from him. His money was taken from him. He was beaten and tormented and left for dead in a wayside. I don't know about you, but that sounds real familiar to me of what's happening to people in our society. When the devil is trying to confuse some people and trying to rob them of their identity, trying to get them to change their identity and trying to leave them at the side of the road half dead because they're tormented and they're confused. But the pastor came by and saw the man in need and went to the other side of the road. Why? Because under judicial law, under the, the, um, the priest's law, he could not touch anybody that was dead because he was on his way to the church and he couldn't do that, so he went to the other side. Same thing with the Levite. The Levite got a little bit closer and he looked. This is why that's significant. Because how many know that there's a difference between seeing somebody and looking at somebody? Because so many times we can be so wrapped up in our Christianity that we just drive right past somebody in need or look right past somebody in need. Where God is saying, I want you to slow down and I want you to look at the situation. Yes, I know they might be acting a certain way. They might be grieving the heart of God. They might be backslidden, but they're not thrown away to the curb. I want you to look at their situation so you can minister to him. And the story goes on that this Samaritan, I could, I, I could hear the people in the crowd hissing because the Samaritan, the Bible says that this man looked past his identity. And you want to know something that, that, that really will, 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 will get you paying attention? The fact that this man was on this road right here meant he probably hated Samaritans. Because this parable takes place on this road. This is why church maps are important, to understand context. This man was on this road. So either A, he lived in Jericho, or B, he was up north and hated the Samaritans. So this man had every right to look at him and say, that man is racist and he hates me and I hate him. Let him die. Walk this way. That's what the, that's what the other two did. But the Bible says that this man was able to look past his gender, look past his culture, look past the color of his skin, look past his failures, and said, I see a man that's in need, so I'm going to go to him, and I'm not just going to tell him what to do and run away. I'm going to get down in the dirt with him, and I'm going to pick him up, and I'm going to bind his wounds, and I'm going to put the oil and the wine on him to bring healing. That's what this man did, and that's what Jesus said is how you respond to your neighbor out of a spirit of gentleness. Would you stand to your feet with me today? Worship team, won't you make your way up? The last, the last thing I wanna share with you is the worship team is coming because I believe this with all of my heart and, and, and I believe this with all my heart. We are living in a society that this is our big issue and this whole message isn't about that but it is a part of it where we're so tempted to just say, ugh, uh, brother, uh, I had to say it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they're looking at this and, and that's what we do. And we walk away. Instead, we can look past that, that, that person who's believed the lies of the enemy, maybe even change their appearance, maybe even change their name. Let me tell you, you can call yourself whatever. You will always be who God created you to be. Beautiful in the image of God. Quit believing the lies of the enemy that you're something other than what God made you to be. We should be here to pour in the oil and the wine, not wag our fingers and shake our heads. We're to be to pour in the oil and the wine and we're to get personal. And you know what I love? The Bible says that this man, the Samaritan, took the wounded man and put him on his own donkey, which means he had to get off and walk. You know, if we're gonna mentor people, if we're gonna disciple people, that means it's gonna inconvenience us a little bit. It means that we're gonna have to have some skin in the game to be up late at night talking them off the ledge if that's what we gotta do. To be up early in the morning taking them to coffee and just trying to support. That's how we be gentle with somebody but firm at the same time because we have to heal them. Amen? We're gonna, we're gonna give our altar call, but I wanna share this with you. In high school, uh, I was able to, some of us, we went through, a, a, our school offered a vocational program. The William D. Ford, it's still, it's still there today in Westland. And so we went for heating and cooling, me and my cousin. A couple of us went for carpentry and we jumped ship and went to HVAC for heating and cooling. This is what we wanted to do. In that class, you had to learn how to, uh, to braise. Now you may have heard of welding. 
You may have heard of soldering, but not a lot of people know what brazing is. Brazing is kind of in the middle, if I could just kind of dump. So when you're dealing with refrigeration, we probably have some HVAC guys. I know we got a couple. So you understand that regular solder can't hold the high pressure refrigeration system, but welding is a bit of an overkill. So you got to learn how to uh, braze. Well, brazing is very expensive. You got to have oxygen and settling. It's a big thing. So they would teach us how to solder first because it's the same concept. And so we would have to take this copper tubing and join it together. And then we would have to learn, we would take a little propane torch, think of it like a low voltage kind of thing. It's real, you know, a little propane torch, kind of harmless, and our solder, and we'd have to learn how to solder. And the teacher said, the number one thing you have to do is get that metal hot. The number one thing you don't want to do is get that metal hot. I didn't understand. Because what he would do is he would make you make the joints and then he would fill it with air and a bucket of water. And if it bubbled, you failed. It was a different time. You lost, you had to repeat the whole semester. No grace, no makeup. So I'll never forget that I began, when I got my little torch and I got my little thing, I began to lean into it and I began to notice that that fire, I didn't think it was very hot, but I would hold it on that copper and guess what, it began to just eat through that copper. It literally began to eat through that copper and dissolve what I thought was copper. So to me, it was no big deal. But to that fire, I was burning this very thing. I was destroying the very thing I was trying to create. The same thing happens to us when we have anger and gentleness out of alignment. I'm out of time on talking about alignment, but this is the bottom line, church. God is telling us, listen, we live in a very difficult world. Unfortunately, the days are gone when we can just say, get right because the Bible says so. Half the people out there don't even know the Bible. They didn't come up like they did in the other generations that everybody went to Sunday school. You can't, you've got to be able to engage with these people like Jesus did. He just, he, when the guy asked him a question, he didn't say, shut up, fool. He said, what does the Bible say and how do you interpret it? I want to see where you are. The good Samaritan, I want to see where you are. Before we, 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 we see a situation, maybe someone was rude to us or mean to us. Can we, instead of spilling back, can we say, hey, you know what? Let me, let me see. Oh, you know what? I just realized, man, they got... I didn't even think, man, they just lost a loved one. Maybe they just lost their job. Maybe they got a lot going on in their life. Like I said, I was, I was repenting 50 times this week. I told my wife, she said, what are you preaching on Sunday? I said, I got gentleness. She went, Pfft. Because it doesn't come easy for some of us, but that's not an excuse. Because we're doing more, like the solder and the fire, we're damaging what we're trying to protect. We come home from work and we're tired and we're yelling at everybody because the house isn't the way that it is or the kids aren't the way that it is. I've been there, I know it. We're all this, listen, I, some of y'all have no, maybe don't identify with anything that I'm saying, but I think some of us do. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a song like we always do and, and we're gonna say this. I don't know how you wanna respond, but we do wanna have a time for response. If you just feel like God wants, wants you to just walk in gentleness, maybe you've got a relationship that you've destroyed. Maybe God is saying a couple weeks ago was kindness and unforgiveness. Maybe God is saying, I want you to go to that person and just mend that relationship. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe you can't do it till you get home. I don't know, uh, but we're gonna have a response time and whatever God wants you to do. Altar team, go, ha go ahead and come up. Maybe you got a doctor's appointment this week and want prayer. We're gonna worship with one more song and you can respond however you want. Hey guys, Pastor Eddie here, and I just want to take a minute and say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to find our YouTube channel. I don't know if it was recommended to you by a friend or you was just searching. Somehow you come across our, our YouTube channel, and I believe it's God. I believe it's God's design that led you here, and I pray that these messages have impacted your life. You know, as a preacher, I always pray, God, I don't want a sermon, I want a message. What do you want to say to your people? And I pray that, have prayed that for years, and I, that's how I pray my uh, messages. So I hope and pray that they've impacted your life. If so, will you do me a favor, do two things. Do one is just comment below or reach out to us and contact us and let us know. Also, hit that subscribe button. We get more traffic, the more subscribers we get, and more people can come across and find these messages and find the message of hope in the gospel through our through our uh, YouTube channel. Also, if you've got a prayer request, we've got a phone number you can text your prayer need to. It's 833-235-5760. So let us know if you've got a prayer request and somebody will be praying with you right away. Again, I wanna say thank you for taking the time. Hopefully this message has impacted your life. God bless you. We'll see you next time.